Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Mike, one of the assistant pastors here on staff at Cornerstone Chapel. And I got to tell you, it is an honor to be able to bring the message to you this morning. And I'm so appreciative of Pastor Mark giving me this opportunity. And you know what? This is going to be a challenge because when Pastor Mark kicked this off uh, several weeks ago, it's been like home run after home run. And as he's been talking about uh, what it means to have the true shepherd to um, someone who we can trust to lead us, to care for us, and to bring healing in our lives. And then last week, my wife hit a home run, not only out of the stadium, but out of the parking lot when she talked about God being the one who, who teaches us to trim the excess in our lives. But we're going to do our best this morning. But before we uh, go any further, you know, it's kind of kind of funny, I guess, but um, when the quarantine first uh, happened, there was a lot of pastors who were posting some stuff on Facebook and social media just talking about, you know, how how are we going to do this to uh, to be able to, to deliver a message with nobody in our congregations, nobody in the seats, no faces to look at, nobody to kind of interact with. And there was fo- uh, post after post where a lot of pastors were putting stuffed animals and then puppets from the children ministry in the chairs. And whether or not they preached like that or not, I have no idea, but we thought it was kind of funny. And we even kind of joked a little bit where we thought, you know what, we know most everybody who does come to Cornerstone and we know where they all sit because you know they sit in the same spot week after week and so we thought we could just print out pictures of their faces and tape them on the back of the chairs and that would at least give give some eye contact and people that that we can just preach to but you know of course we didn't do that but this morning I did do something a little different and I thought that uh I just set up my kind of my own cast of characters here that I thought I would just take a second just to introduce you so check this out So let's kick things off with the Black Panther, Admiral Akbar, Assassin Droid IG-88, Bosk the Bounty Hunter, Mr. Potato Head, Minus Mouth, Ultimate Warrior, Andre the Giant, Lando Calrissian, Michelangelo and Donatello, Jabba the Hutt, Julio Franco, Alfie, Kylo Ren, Bernie Kosar and Ozzie Newsome, John Hannibal Smith from the A-Team, I love it when a plan comes together, Larry Nance, Animal, Gonzo, Fozzie, Fonzie, the child, a.k.a. Baby Yoda, Skeletor, and last but not least, Mr. Rogers and Daniel Striped Tiger. So it is so awesome to have my cast of characters here with me, my friends, my companions for this journey, and it is so awesome to be in your living rooms today uh, bringing the word. So, you know, Pastor Mark and Mel have done a phenomenal job of, of the, with this series of trusting our shepherd, experiencing God's goodness in not-so-good times. And so what I want to do is is take what they've done and just kind of build on that so we understand that that God We can trust him to be our good shepherd, right? Well, I believe that not only are we supposed to trust him to be our good shepherd, but also we ourselves are shepherds. Think about it. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, if you are a counselor, a manager, or boss, somebody who you where you oversee people, you are responsible to love them, to bring healing, to bring guidance, to care for them, to lead them, all of that. So really, when you think about it, we're all shepherds. And so Jesus has given us the perfect model of of how we are supposed to shepherd. But I believe we're not just supposed to shepherd people within our sphere of influence. I really believe that we're supposed to go beyond our sphere of influence and really reach out to and shepherd the people in this world who we would consider to be marginalized, the marginalized in society. Now, what does that mean? Well, usually it's a it's a greater society that kind of dictates who's in and who's out. Maybe you've experienced this before. Oftentimes, this can be somebody um, being on the outskirts based on uh, finances, the economy, um, often poor. It definitely includes people of different races. Oftentimes, based on your race, you are on the outskirts of of society. Um, It can be gender, sexual orientation, religion, and often people who are living on these outskirts of society, they often have little power and even little influence in the greater society. And they may be, they may feel that they're not very important or that they have much to contribute. But, you know, you can't get too far reading the Gospels when you realize that Jesus was all about reaching out to the marginalized, and he did it time and time again. And so I believe that we as shepherds, as Christ followers, we're modeling after him what it means to be a good shepherd, and we too are called to the marginalized. 
And so what I want to do this morning is I want to read a passage out of Luke 25, 37, the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, you may have never opened up a Bible before in your life, but I'm sure you've heard that term, the Good Samaritan, and you know what it's all about. And so to give a little bit of context here, um, you need to understand that there's like a 700-year animosity between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. Uh, the Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile. Some of them worshipped other gods. A lot of them married uh, people of other religions. And there was this big debate as far as where the temple should be set up. The Samaritans thought it was somewhere else. The, the Jewish people felt it should be in Jerusalem. And so there was, again, this 700-year uh, division, animosity, that these two groups had against each other. Um, the Jewish people really like considered Samaritans like you couldn't get any worse than a Samaritan. That was like bottom of the barrel. So uh, let's get real, let's get into this. Uh, the story that Jesus shares about the Good Samaritan and we're going to kind of break it down a little bit as we go. So Luke 10 25 through 37 you can follow along with me. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You who have answered correctly, do this, and you will live. But this is where it gets a little, little tricky here. The lawyer then says, Desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Now that's interesting. And you kind of wonder why the lawyer said that. Is he looking for a loophole here? Like, are there certain people in his life where he's like, okay, I can love that person, that person, that person, that person, but that person right there? Whoo, heck no, man. I cannot bring myself to love that person. Have you ever felt that way? Maybe. I know I have. And so he's looking for this loophole to justify himself for loving or potentially hating somebody else. And so then Jesus replies. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So this priest and Levite, who should have been the ones taking care of this man, who should have had that compassion, didn't just sidestep. It sounds like they got to the other side of the road to walk. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave it to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend I will repay you when I come back. Now, did you pick up on all of what the Samaritan did? Not only did he have compassion on this man, he picked him up put him on his own animal, and then they walked to the inn. He bandaged him. He took care of his wounds. And then when he goes to leave the next day, he gives money to the innkeeper, which, which scholars say basically the amount that he gave was about three to four weeks wages to take care of this man. That, in my opinion, is going above and beyond for those who are in need. Jesus finished saying, to the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. It's really interesting there because why didn't the lawyer say the Samaritan? Why didn't he just call it out? Though the Samaritan, that's, he's the good guy in the story. But he just happened to say, well, the one who showed mercy makes me think that maybe even the lawyer had a hard time fathoming that Jesus was calling him to love the marginalized, the Samaritans who they have had years upon years of hatred and animosity and difference. 
So, of course, we see the Samaritan here. He is the hero, and he really is the one who Jesus is teaching how how his listeners were supposed to emulate. And I believe this story is for us today. The InterVarsity Press New Testament commentary of Luke says, Neighbors are not determined by race, creed, or gender. Neighbors consist of anyone in need made in the image of God. I love that. Made in the image of God. Think about it. Are you, have you ever been in need? We all have, of course, right? If we've ever been in need, and if we're living, and if we're breathing, we've been made in the image of God. And I think this is why this bothers God so much when there is division because when you look back at Genesis 1 and you see uh, the, the creation of the world, man is the last thing to be created and God says to the Trinity, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, he says, let us make man in our own image. And so not only is this amazing because we see how we kind of have this sort of special place among creation that we humans, nothing else, is created in the image of God, but, but we are. And so I think because the original intent was, would be that there would be unity because the Trinity, of course, that, there's unity there, right? And so when God says, let us make man in our own image, the expectation would be that man would be united like the Trinity. At least that was the hope, I'm sure. But I'm sure when God sees all of the division, it just breaks his heart. And going back to this reality that we are created in the image of God, that should humble us. That should cause us to look a little bit differently on people who may be a little different than us, who look a little different, who talk a little different, who believe and live differently than us. Because the reality of, of what I see in Scripture they're still created in the image of God. And since we are created in the image of God, we don't have the right to bring down or belittle the image of God just because we don't agree with it or understand where they're coming from. So for the remainder of our time here, what I'd like to do is I want to just kind of point out a few different things in which ways I believe that God is calling us to reach out to the marginalized in our society, to those who have been pushed to the outskirts, to those who are in need. First off, we need to understand the heart of God, and I think the Good Samaritan story is a great way to start. Again, you can go back to the Gospels, and story after story, you will read Jesus reaching out to the marginalized, to those who have been brushed off by society. But this isn't just a new thing with Jesus. You know, sometimes we can read the Old Testament and the New Testament and think that maybe it was a different God or that God thought differently in the Old Testament than he did in the New. I don't know, but it's the same God. And God's intention from the very beginning for his people would be that we would care for the marginalized. It says in Leviticus. Now, the Jewish people had about 613 commandments or so that they, they, they needed to adhere to, and this was one of these. Leviticus 23:22 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your corner or gather gleanings from your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And likewise, Deuteronomy 24:19 says, when you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, now a sheaf is a big bundle of grain. When you overlook a sheaf, do not go back for it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your work, uh, in all the work of your hands. Now, who, who, now think about this real quick. You've got a field. Now that field is your livelihood. So that's where you get your food for your family for the year. That's where you take and, and sell so that you can continue to provide for your family and, and provide for more grain for the next year. And then what God says is this, leave a corner of it. Don't glean all of it. If you drop some, leave it there on the ground. Don't pick it up, just leave it there. And I want you to leave it for the widow the orphan, and the foreigner. People who are traveling through, we would today call them immigrants. So don't look, don't look at all this as yours for the taking. Like, 
you need to actually give it. It's very similar to the modern, not modern concept of tithing, but, but we call it tithing today. We give 10% to the Lord. And so, you know, there are so many times where I feel like, you know, we need to allow our rights and our privileges and, and those things that we think are coming to us, we need to allow those things to be infringed upon for the sake of others. You know, I'm sure that many people didn't like the idea that they had to leave some for people who maybe they felt didn't deserve it. They worked hard for that. They should be able to glean every bit of it. But God was saying, no, he was building this within, within his community, his followers saying, no, we're going to be, you're going to be a compassionate people. You're going to be thinking not just of your family. You're going to be thinking about people out there in the margins who just need help. Number, number two that we want to look at is we need to be moved with compassion. Now, when I say moved with compassion, I'm not talking about watching a Hallmark movie and getting all sad and sappy and be like, oh, man, that really moved me, if that's your thing. Um, but what I'm talking about really is being moved, like taking action that when we see a need, we want to do something about it. When we see somebody on the outskirts, somebody who's been pushed away by society based on how they look, born, economic situations, whatever it may be, that we need to be moved with compassion. I've the last year or so I've been reading several books about Mr. Rogers and he's really become kind of a hero in 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 my life where I can just um look at how he loved people and how and he was just constant flowing from him and that was many things that a lot of the 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 writers would say about him is that he was always kind of looking for the person who was on the margins, who were on the outskirts and and he never closed the door to anybody. And um, I'm going to read a story. It's a pretty popular story. I've came across a few times in um, some of the books that I've read. I'm going to take this from the book by Shay Tuttle, Exactly As You Are, The Life and Faith of Mr. Rogers. And um, she's actually, what she's doing, she's quoting a, a, a story that was written about him by the author, uh, journalist Tom, Tom Janad, uh, who wrote this article about Mr. Rogers back in the 90s. And so you're going to hear a little bit of, of Mr. Rogers and uh, Tom Janad's uh, interaction in here as well but but check this out for fred people on the margins reveal deeper ways of being where acceptance of self and others is built not on social capital but on simple existence we are good because we are gods and the poor in spirit those overlooked or outcast help all of us to know this better in tom Janode's Definitive profile of Fred Rogers, originally published in 1998, he tells a story about Mr. Rogers visiting a teenage boy with cerebral palsy. The boy had been abused early in his childhood, and now a teen, he struggled with self-hatred and self-harm. Janab tells the story this way. At first, the boy was made very nervous by the thought that Mr. Rogers was visiting him. He was so nervous, in fact, that when Mr. Rogers did visit, he got mad at himself and began hating himself and hitting himself. And his mother had to take him to another room and talk to him. Mr. Rogers didn't leave, though. He wanted something from the boy. And Mr. Rogers never leaves when he wants something from somebody. He just waited patiently. And when the boy came back, Mr. Rogers talked to him. And then he made his request. He said, I would like you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? On his computer, the boy answered, yes, of course. He would do anything for Mr. Rogers. So Mr. Rogers said, I would like you to pray for me. Will you pray for me? When Fred told Tom this story, Tom complimented him on asking the boy for his prayers, since this would surely make the boy, the boy feel proud and important. But Fred was confused by his response. Oh, heavens no, Tom, he said. I didn't ask him for his prayers for him. I asked for me. I asked because I think that anyone who has gone through challenges like that must be very close to God. I asked him because I wanted his intercession. People who are different, who have been marginalized by society, are spiritual teachers and friends of God. Now, whether or not you believe that part that people with struggles and challenges in life are particularly closer to God, that's up for you to, to debate. I love that thought 
myself and um, just the fact that Mr. Rogers was able to look at this young teen and see that he's created in the image of God and that he is created with purpose and he had a voice and a capacity to contribute far beyond maybe he ever thought he could by praying for Mr. Rogers. So we need to be moved with compassion. We need to look in the eyes of those who are hurting, those who are in need, those who are on the margins, and speak value into their lives. And lastly, we need to be able to, to take a stand sometimes. You know, I want to read a pretty familiar story out of the book of Mark, Mark 11. Um, go ahead and turn with me there if you have your Bibles open or you can follow along um, here. But um, this is one of those scenes when Jesus just shows how passionate he can be about reaching the marginalized. Mark eleven fifteen through 19. And Jesus came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, those who bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Now let's understand what's going on here. The fact that there were people selling animals and money changers wasn't the issue. In fact, they were there out of convenience because you had people traveling for miles upon miles, days upon days, just to get to the temple to offer sacrifices and to worship their God. And it was not always convenient for them to carry with them animals for these sacrifices. And so it was, it was made easier so that, um, and the chief priests allowed this, that people could sell these animals in the courtyard. And so that way they didn't have to bring them with them. And you needed money changers because you would have foreign currency, Roman currency, Greek currency, that the temple wouldn't accept. And so therefore it had to be changed into a currency that the, the, that the temple would recognize. And so these were necessary. These selling animals, these money changers were necessary. But the place with, where this took place is where I think the big issue was. If you take a look at this map here, you see the temple. You see right there in the middle, that big structure. Now that is, that's the sanctuary. And that's where you would want to get as close there to worship God as possible. And when you look at the divisions here, you'll see that the priests were the only, were, were the only ones who were allowed to get close to the sanctuary. And just out fa- outside of that, the men were allowed to be right there. And behind them, in the same court, they were, it was called the, the Court of Women. Um, they were allowed to be on the south side, the women there. But outside here, in the courtyard... That's where the Gentiles, that's as far as the Gentiles could go. And you know what was going on there? You guessed it. That's where they were selling all of the animals. Now imagine, imagine going to a place like, like let's just say the West Side Market here in Cleveland. If you've ever been there, you know all of the sights and the sounds and the smells and all the things that can be really, really distracting. You know, it, that would be a really, really hard place to go and just worship and hear from the Lord. You know? Like, and so imagine being there, the Gentiles could come this far, but they couldn't even get in there to worship God. And they had to stay out here where the animals were, where all of the distractions were, where all the stuff was going on. And it was really hard for them to be able to worship God. And so this, I believe, is why Jesus was so mad at what was going on. The book of John says that Jesus actually fashioned a whip. He made a whip. And so I've never made a whip before in my life. Is this a two minute job, a five minute job? Either way, Jesus was really thinking through how he needed to get his point across. And so he did that by driving everybody out with this whip, flipping over cha- tables, flipping over chairs, and getting everybody out of there. And, and you know, I think, honestly, I think sometimes it's okay to get ticked off when we see injustice. Now, the reality is that we still we still need to love. That needs to be the driving force behind everything that we do. But we can see we can get ticked off when we see injustice. We can get passionate, we can get fired up. In fact, I think sometimes we have to as long as we are carrying that mantle of love with us. 
many of you have heard in the news and have been watching this story unfold about um, Ab Ahmaud Arbery, a 25-year-old man, African-American man, who was jogging one day, and um, two men thought he was, two white men thought that he was a burglar in their area, and grabbed their guns and kind of went after him. And um, things went down really bad, really quick, and Ahmad was killed. And this is unfortunately a very, um, seems to be a very common story. This isn't new to us. Um, even though I understand that the story is still under investigation, there's still a lot that we don't know, but it seems as though we've been here before. Many people are calling this a modern day lynching and if you had, were alive in the 50s or the 60s you know that this was this was kind of commonplace in the south and no doubt racism is alive today. Um, unfortunately all the efforts done in the civil rights movement didn't abolish, um, didn't abolish racism and I still think it's something that is worth fighting for today because it is an absolute injustice. Many of you know my kids um, are African American. For those of you who don't, they're African American. And my wife and I, we've had to have some, some, some honest and really difficult and very unfortunate conversations with our kids. And um, we've had to tell, particularly our boys, to be careful how they dress um, because we know that they could be perceived differently by society. If they got a hood on when in public, maybe take that hood off. Let people see your face. If your hands are in your pockets, take your hands out of your pocket. Let people see your hands. Make sure you're kind and polite and you smile. That's a horrible conversation to have with your child. Right or wrong, we felt that it was necessary because they could be looked upon differently. And to do our best to parent them, to shepherd them, we want to protect them because we love them so much. You know, it is my hope that someday we will all live in a world where we are not judged by the color of our skin but by the content of our character, that we're not being judged by our past, by we are not being judged by our life, current lifestyles, that we are able to be loved where we are. And I really and truly believe that as Christians, that is our mandate. That is what God has called us to do in helping to be reconcilers, as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians, to be reconcilers to be ambassadors for Christ. Look around you. Not so much in your living room here, um, because I'm sure your family members look just like you and probably believe a lot of the same that, that, that you believe. But I mean, look beyond your house. Look into your neighborhoods, the people in your neighborhoods. Close your eyes if you need to. See the people in your neighborhoods. See the people in your schools. The people at your workplace. The people who may not necessarily be in your neighborhood, but they're within your community, but they're not really, you don't really know them. You don't know their stories. You see, we are created in, in the image of God, and we, are, and we are a bunch of characters, for sure. But God has loved us, God has cared for us. God has created us to be His hands and His feet to this broken, broken world. And I believe we're going to do that by going out and reaching the marginalized. You know, we're all different, and different is good. Different shows God's creativity. You know, God has created some of us some of us to be leaders. God has created some of us strong and God has created some of us who just need protection. God has created us, some of us as superstars and super smart. 
Some of us are heroes from a comic book that represents more than a story but a powerful people and some others are simply real life heroes. You know, I believe that God has created us all differently, all uniquely, and all equally for all glory to God. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, we thank you for diversity. We thank you that we're not all the same. And God, we thank you that you love us all the same. We thank you that we are special, created in the image of God, and that we have this mandate to go out and be reconcilers. It's a big task. It seems impossible, but God, you have called us to this. And when I believe that when we are going out, you being our example, Christ, of what it means to be a good shepherd, what it means to reach the marginalized, and when, and when love is the complete motivation of why we're going to people, I believe the world can change and injustice can be done away with. Lord, for anybody here this morning that is, that is hearing this message for the first time, the message of you creating us as the image of God, I pray that they too would see themselves as your creation, as the image of God. Lord, I pray that there would be such freedom today. And I pray that if there are people out there who don't know you, I pray that they would come to know you, that they would respond to your love. And Lord, for the rest of us who are hearing this message, I pray, God, that you help us to put this into practice. To be your hands and feet, to bring restoration, to bring reconciliation to a broken, unjust world. And to be your complete example of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for experiencing with us today. But don't let this be the end of your journey this week. Let's keep trusting and chasing after God. If you accepted Jesus for the first time today, let us know so that we can resource you. Just comment below, message any of our hosts, or text the word RESPOND to 330-969-9238. Experience again with us next week, and don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Cornerstone Chapel, Medina. Let's stay connected, helpful, and hopeful. We'll see you soon.